Paul Levy with Brownells here. Today I'm joined by John Paul with JP Enterprises. John, thank you for joining us. Well, Paul, it's great to be here. I haven't been down to your uh, facility here in some years, so yeah. good to be back again. Oh yeah, uh, love to have you anytime. Uh, and today we're doing a Facebook Live. Uh, if you have questions for John, please send them our way uh, in the comments uh, below. We'll answer as many as we can. Uh, and if you have questions after the video ends, Go ahead and put them in there anyways, and we'll get back to you. either somebody from Brownells or we'll have somebody from JP respond to you with the, uh, the proper answer. Um, so today, we, uh, we're talking everything JP. We've got some new stuff to look at, uh, some really cool stuff, and uh, we've got some legacy stuff to discuss as well. So Yeah, we go a long way back with Brownells. In fact, uh, I had a retail shop for 13 years at... Mm -hmm. Uh, in North Minneapolis, and that's, that shop was actually started shortly after uh, World War II by the Strage family. Yeah. And when I took it over, I, I uh, started dealing with Brownells, and, and I'd call them up, and I'd say, what's your customer number? And I said, well, it's L41. Yeah. And I said, oh, man, that's an old customer <laughs> number. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, so, we, and we've been carrying your products in our catalog for quite some time, so obviously Brownells didn't start out. We're, we're 80 years old now. Um, and we didn't start out carrying AR products, and I think you were one of the first AR manufacturers where we had your product in the catalog. Probably, yeah. Yeah, our, our partnership in terms of our product line really goes uh, back uh, almost to the beginning of this for me, mm -hmm. and I realized then that, I mean, uh, it was after being, having been in the retail business, I knew that Brownells was the purveyor of, mm -hmm. of custom uh, components for uh, gunsmithing, and so I, I made use of that over those years I was there. I was ordering stuff from Brownells every week, really. Yeah in terms of building all the, I did a lot of custom pistol work and custom okay. rifle work at the time. And and uh, you guys just had the product and uh, and certainly the technical expertise and backing it up. Yeah. So when I got into this, I said, well, if I'm gonna make it, my products have to be in Brownells. And, and I, I think it was anecdotally, I think it's kind of a neat story what, what happened then. And my, the first year I went to SHOT Show, not to display, but I just went there to meet a couple of people. And one mm -hmm. of the things on my list was to establish myself with uh, Brownells. And I, I don't know, I had made three or four products I had. Yeah. And uh, I had an appointment at the Brownells booth at 1.30 in the afternoon. And I dropped my stuff off. And you had four people at a table that yeah, were analyzing this. And, and they didn't want to talk to me. They, I just dropped the stuff off there, and then I, I stepped back about 50 yards, and I just watched. And they took the product out of the bags, and put it on the table, and didn't even look at the product. And they got out the instruction sheets, and they started reading the instructions. And at the time, I thought it was really important to have good instructions. Yeah. And absolutely. they were started. I saw them nodding like this, and I said, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've always been big on copy and big on instructions. Here, yep. They liked my instructions, and they realized. That would take a, a big burden off of your tech staff. And so uh, that's always something that we have really brought to the forefront in all of our products yeah. is having instructions that really walk somebody through the process of whatever it may be, installation, or, you know, so that the, you've yeah. got the right information. Yeah, you've got great instructional videos for yeah. installing any of your stuff. What do you think the first product was? That was a, well, my a first product was the was this oh, <laughs> the recoil that, eliminator. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was at the range one day and I I saw this guy oh, with wow. a with a 300 Win Mag uh, bolt gun, and he had this uh, three by five steel like plate suspended in front of the muzzle with some wires that were welded up on here and I thought it was the craziest looking thing I ever saw but it was apparent to me that this thing really worked because the rifle had very little recoil left yeah. and I thought well how was I going to incorporate that into something that would fit in the gun case and wouldn't be so butt ugly that no one would ever buy it yeah. <laughs> and that's how we came up with with this and you know and I, I thought that the popularity of this thing would diminish over the years and it has just continued to grow. Yeah. Is, uh, especially in the Magnum bolt gun area, uh, really a performance of that that brick is just amazing, and and uh, the angles on it and the way that it just has very neutral, so yep. there's no one muzzle dip to it. It's just an elimination of recoil, and also you see that it keeps your dust signature low. It's not yeah, blasting. You never you never want to break on a rifle that's got holes pointed down. I'll tell yeah. you that because that's going to be blowing all kinds of debris debris up, and you can have secondary projectiles in your face with the sand. That's pretty cool to have your original product still an active speed that's still right. selling, still we, moving we, for you. We've just had to make more and more of them every year, which kind of astounds me, really. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Um, so then from there, you got the recoil yep. eliminator and those started to move. You're still in that shop. Where do things move from there? Well, you know, I, I, um, I've told this story a couple of times, but I used to hate the AR-15 rifle. Mm -hmm. I thought it was one of the most ugly things. And, yeah. and, uh, and I wouldn't even have them on the shelf. Oh, 
<laughs> so, but uh, one day I was forced to take one and trade. I took this old, it was a Colt A1 Sporter with the triangular forearm mm -hmm. and the real lightweight barrel. And, and I thought, well, as long as I have it, I better take this thing out of the range and with some of my hand loads and see what the thing can actually do. So uh, I had some hand loads from a varmint rifle I had. And to my amazement, the rifle shot about a minute and a half, just the way it was. And I thought, gee, there's actually probably some potential, some potential yeah. here. And so at, the, at that time, uh, Olympic Arms was making this all steel, free floating one piece handguard. I mean, it mm -hmm. weighed like five pounds. You could have killed somebody with it. <laughs> and I, I put that on there, and the rifle shot sub minute with that, wow. you know, with that handguard and my, my hand loads. And then I realized that, yep, th this rifle really had some serious potential. Shortly after that, I ended up getting in the action shooting community and sh shot a, a three gun match somewhere, and I realized that that was uh, my addiction there. And I realized that the AR-15 really was the only rifle, in my opinion, that was competitive for, for that application mm -hmm. because of its ergonomics, the way it reloaded, yeah. its impulse feel. But it, it had all kinds of problems. And I just then set about solving you each one of those problems. Each one of them. Yeah. <laughs> the first being the trigger. Yeah. You, know, you just had to have a good trigger on the rifle. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, uh, the two-stage trigger was out there for the AR-type rifles because mm -hmm. the high park crowd was kind of... You know, immersed yeah. in two-stage triggers yeah. on their M1As and M1 Garands. And when the black rifle came into the scene, they wanted that same trigger feel. So they had the Krieger Malazzo and the Armalite. And I wanted a, a single-stage trigger because it had very little over-travel, very, very short reset, and a very mm -hmm. short break. And I thought for the action rifle, that's what I wanted was a, that very short overall break feel and extremely short okay. reset. So the, the pre pre prevailing wisdom was that you just could not possibly have a single stage trigger in these rifles due to durability issues and technicalities of I won't bore you with, yeah. but I solved all those problems. So we had the first viable single stage trigger, and if you've used one, you know oh, that yeah. it's, it's a great single stage They're trigger. Yeah. And we, we owned that trigger market then for, for many years with our single stage trigger, mm -hmm. which uh, really it was so durable that it really became a, a lifetime trigger. You install mm -hmm. one in there and it's, it would you know, last the life of the rifle. Yeah. So then, of course, we were one of the first that did modular triggers, and uh, we did those for about a year. We pulled back from it, and then we re reintroduced this now, and so we have one of the best modular triggers this out there. This is kind of going back to your one of your original products then, your, yeah. this new line of uh, modular drop-in triggers. Uh, and we've got a, a new video coming on these, but do you want to walk through what yeah, you've got sure. right here for your current trigger lineup? Yeah, I, I realized, of course, that instant gratification was the thing, and because our, our standard single stage trigger required some amount of setup and uh, a little bit of mechanical finesse and we wanted to make it as easy as possible to install we got the module there you go. it also includes a, a dedicated safety with dual levers so you got an ambi setup and it's also got anti-walk uh, oversized anti-walk pins to eliminate all that slop in the trigger when it's when it's installed mm -hmm. so it's perfectly rock solid we also have three different possible trigger shoe designs depending on what turns you crank. We got the traditional arched, we have a flat, and then you got my favorite, the, the roller here, which I have to credit Tom Fuller with from Armageddon Gear. He came up with this idea a few years back and uh, we proposed uh, doing a, a roller trigger for the AR. Mm -hmm. He explained to me what this was about and I really wasn't buying yeah. it <laughs> until I, we finally put one together and the first time I went to the range with it and I, I have to do all the accuracy testing, I've done a lot of that, it's pretty tedious. And so uh, anything that can help me in that department and make me more consistent. Well, I got on this thing and all of a sudden I realized that it was getting rid of most of my, you know, it was getting rid of my flyers. And I realized that I was rolling to center and what it, what it did was that it made my release force now completely on bore axis. So there was mm -hmm. no question about it. It was on bore axis with the release force. And that was one of those little error things that was getting in the way of maybe uh, shooting consistent tight groups yeah. over and over again. So I have this in all of my precision rifles. That's fantastic. And, uh, and of course, I advocate using the trigger in the first knuckle of mm -hmm. your of your f trigger finger, not the pad like you would on a bolt gun, but on a gas gun. I I really suggest that you shoot it with the with the trigger riding in your first knuckle, so that when you release it, you can hold the trigger back until the rifle the impulse subsides, and then you then you release it, mm -hmm. and you hear that click of the reset. And that gives you your best accuracy, plus it eliminates the possibility of you ever having a finger bounce double. Okay. Yeah. So you got a lot of control with that trigger. Yeah. And the other options that, you know, triggers are, like you said, are very subjective. They so are. So uh, you've got, got something for everybody out there. Yeah. And of course, and I'm, I'm, that's very liter literally, uh, uh, triggers are subjective. And this trigger really represents what I think a trigger should be mm -hmm. in terms of its release feel and 
even and the reset very important to me yeah. the what the reset i want a mechanical feel to the reset yeah and uh i know there's triggers out there right now that i've noticed that have actually no reset feel to them yeah or which, nothing audible or yeah, it's just kind of right. okay what just happened <laughs> which I, I don't particularly care for but like i say it's 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 yeah. subjective and i do want to mention to everyone we're live right now so uh uh, send us your questions. We'd be happy to answer them, or, well, John will answer them. <laughs> I'll convey them to John, and uh, we'll get them uh, read on air here. And I think we have uh, one here from Daniel. Uh, he asks, when and where did the idea for the captive buffer spring take form, and what problem was it suppo supposed to solve? So onward to our next product <laughs> discussion. Uh, yeah, the, we have silent, we actually have some here. The silent um, captured spring That's system. a great question, uh, uh, Daniel. How did you come up with that idea? Well, you know, uh, one, as we started building these rifles years ago, one of, the, one of my pet peeves was that terrible noise that you get. It was kind of, I kind of uh, compared it to a, a spoon on a cheese grater, you know, as, this, as the, uh, the buffer and the spring would collapse inside yep. the extension tube. And I just could not, I mean, it made the whole rifle seem so cheap. Yep. And, and I said, we, we've got to work our way around this. And so what we first did was, we started to custom grind our springs in-house, and we actually put a little flat on the outside of them. And, uh, and we really made it, that we addressed the interior of the buffer, buffer tubes, and we actually came up with something that was like an order of magnitude better than it was. But ultimately, I knew that I had to completely eliminate any contact of the spring to the extension tube. And so I had this idea in my head about this captured system. And we worked through several iterations before we finally came up with uh, with what we have, and and, uh, and not this is a, happens to be a nine millimeter version mm -hmm. of it, but we have these for all applications. And the beauty of it is because it's a modular system, we can tune this for really tightly tune it for a particular application. And as you can see, uh, it's got a spring and a guide rod, which is nothing unusual. But the really the really important aspect of it, the unique aspect of it, is it combines all this with a buffering system which provides the essential dead blow hammer effect because you know there's a lot of cheap copies of this thing out there yeah. right now and they don't quite get that aspect of it and the reason why this is so reliable is it has the buffering effect of the dead blow hammer prevents effect. prevents that bolt bounce yeah. that you might experience right. otherwise so that's that was really how this evolved and, and once we came out with this we, we we realized we could expand it into all these applications and a really good application now which was it was, it was a suppressor application mm -hmm. where we've got a, an extra heavy version of this, especially in the 308 category rifles, uh, where we got extra mass in it, and we've also got reciprocating mass on our carrier, the BC-7 carrier for those rifles. So we're doubling up, actually, on the buffering component, allowing <clears throat> uh, so, so much dead blow hammer effect that there's no, bu no bolt bounce whatsoever. So when you're running the suppressor on the gun, even after the, the receiver and the bolt carrier fouls up as, as they will, it hammers this thing closed. And it, the, the typical malfunction is that once they get fouled up, the bolt will bounce out or the carrier will bounce out and it will stay out. And then you have a failure to ignite because of an out of battery Light situation. Tries, the hammer can't get This that thing hammer. just yeah. slams that thing all the way closed and it mm -hmm. stays there, it will not bounce out. So you solve that malfunctioning issue that is a result of fouling building up in the receiver over time. And then secondarily, uh, it increases the overall mass of the system, which controls your bolt velocity. That's your second source of malfunctions on, yeah. say, suppressed rifles is excessive bolt velocity with the can on, and then you get in this situation where you've got stove pipes for, because the cartridge doesn't have time to clear the ejection port, or you're ripping the rim off the case, or yeah. whatever, you know. Okay, and then you get that benefit of it's quiet and it's smooth as glass, <laughs> which well, is when people pick it that up, that's too. what they notice right, right away. All of a sudden, yeah, they cycle the rifle and they go, oh my God. <laughs> It's like a whole new, yeah, basically everybody <laughs> shooting an AR competition is using one of these. Yeah, it's, that product's been a real home run for us. Yeah, so. That's fantastic. Uh, check real quick. We got more uh, questions here. Uh, Michael asks, uh, do you have the modular trigger for the older Colt SP-1 pin systems, the larger pins? We don't, but actually that would be a fairly easy modification okay. if you wanted to ream out the, the, the pin barrels here okay. to take the 069 so have a pin. gunsmith do that for us. And, uh, and I believe we have a copious amount of those old pins left okay. that we have no use for. But, okay. yeah, that is, uh, that is a possibility, I think, that you just would take this out to the uh, 169. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you still have the older easy trigger for the large pins or, or no? I believe we still have some, okay. uh, you know, even though because those, those receivers have kind of 
diminished in yeah. terms of their their use now. Uh, People want to keep them as is now. Exactly, really you know. Modifying them. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Good question. Uh, that's an interesting one, James. We got a lot of questions coming. So by the way, if you're just tuning in, feel free to shoot us your questions. John from uh, John or JP Industries is here answering your questions. Uh, so James asks. Uh, do these silent capture springs help reduce the amount of gas needed to cycle the rifle? Well, that's a, a more complicated question than what you might think. So, uh, with whatever the cartridge say, and probably a good example of this is say that the 300 Blackout, mm -hmm. uh, which is a relatively low pressure cartridge, and and to get a 300 Blackout to work, say in an AR, AR type rifle, you've got to go with the pistol port position. And uh, if you want to shoot both subsonic and supersonic rounds, then the port has to be uh, of a more significant size to allow those subsonic rounds to, rounds to run at all. So <clears throat> really, the gas is really controlled at the port, and that's why we make adjustable gas. We were the first company to do adjustable yep. gas blocks. And, you know, when we started doing that, everybody said, why are you doing that? Why do you need these things? Well, there again, we, we did it initially uh, to control the recoil impulse, because once we put the brakes on the rifle, mm -hmm. and we eliminated the the effect of the bullet leaving the barrel, the re, you know the the reaction counter reaction of the of actual recoil from the bullet leaving the system, well then what I noticed was that the guns had a lot of impulse field due to the reciprocation of the action, and it was apparent very obviously to me that the rifles were cycling much faster than they had to, and they were way over gassed. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where we came up with the adjustable gas block to mitigate that and get the gas, get the bolt velocity in the sweet part, in the sweet spot, which not only makes the rifle much faster and smoother to shoot, but improves the durability and reliability of the whole system. Yeah. People finally figured that out, and now you see that there's a lot of gas systems out yeah. there. So get a JP adjustable so, gas block in addition to the silent yeah. capture. So yeah, the, the, I, I would say that the answer, the, the big answer to that question is no, it really doesn't uh, affect, <clears throat> say, how much gas or being able to run it with less gas. You, because uh, that gets into more of the mass regulation mm -hmm. and the consistency of the eternal ballistics of the, of the given cartridge to be able to produce a consistent port pressure, say. Okay. And all right, we have to, to further go down that, that uh, particular question. Uh, all of the gas, all of the spring systems we sell, you can buy a sp spring kits with have three, four, you know, up to five different springs. Mm -hmm. So then you can vary, vary your spring weight and your mass. And okay, could you set the rifle up to run with less port pressure by going down that road? Yes, I mean you could do that. Yeah. But that's it makes for a marginal difference, and you're always better off to have uh, more gas in you. My my advice is yeah, you definitely want the rifle slightly overgassed. And it, it, it needs to be cycled so that you have more than, say, reliable lockback. Now, we've got some people out there, like barometer shooters, who they, they don't care. The, the gun doesn't actually have to work, so they will turn it right, tune it right to the Nats ass and have it functioning mm -hmm. just barely to lock back. And the rifle may not lock back consistently, but guess what? That gives you the best possible feel because the buffer and the, the whatever, if you're using standard buffer or spring system, is just barely kissing the back. Yeah. And then you eliminate that aspect of the impulse feel completely. But that, if for a real world, world rifle, uh, you, it's gotta be slightly over gassed so that it's gonna lock back even if the thing is fouled or the weather's cold yeah. and your lube is kind of solidified, whatever. Okay. All right, so uh, you mentioned it with the adjustable gas block. You've kind of been early on on a lot of these things. Whether it's triggers, right. uh, the adjustable gas block, um, and then the chassis. You've had a aluminum style, AI style chassis for a decade probably now. Yeah, we were one of the very yeah. first ones, and uh, that kind of evolved from uh, when I first got into the precision shooting mm -hmm. <coughs> in area. One of my former employees had he had moved out to Gillette, Wyoming, and he ROed the uh, Dave Locks match, the International Tactical Rifle uh, Championship (ITRC), and uh, I had read about that match. Quite honestly, for reading about it, it was just intimidating. I said, yeah. "I can't do that," and uh, so Chad went out there and ROed it, and and. Uh, he called me up and he said, look, we got to shoot this match. And he says, we can do it. I said, okay. <laughs> and so it was a two-man team event. Yeah. The stages were like several miles long, uphill, you know. It was, it was physically grueling. Yeah. And he had a, a, a precision shooter who shot the long-range targets and a carbine shooter who shot the mid-range targets. <clears throat> and I shot the carbine. Uh, he had the ability to shoot 800 yards on his own property, so obviously he was going to be the, the bolt gun it. guy at the time. And then, uh, of course, 
I, he, he had a, a rifle and an existing chassis system at that time that was out there, a very popular chassis system. I think it was the only one at that time. And I played around with that a bit, and I had one of my rifles in that chassis system. I just could not stand the feel of it ergonomically because I was really hooked on the ergonomics <coughs> of the gas guns. Yep. So I decided that I wanted to bring that type of the gas gun ergonomics into the manual rifle world, and that's what we did with the very first chassis. And that, that was pretty successful for us for some time. But we did use a Magpul PRS stock as a, as a solution for the buttstock, and we wanted to get the weight down and we wanted to have our own buttstock and further improve the hinge on it. So we've, this, we've, this project has been in the works for about two years now and it's a complete evolution from that and I'm really excited about it. So it's this is the, the new state of the art chassis, the APAC. Uh, right. So this is uh, combines all those lessons learned and really what customers are asking for now. Yep, right. Uh, and it's a pretty impressive uh, setup you have here. Um, the one thing I noticed right away when uh, your team visited here last time was the uh, folding mechanism. It is like a, it is a bank vault. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, that, you cannot have any play whatsoever yeah. in the hinge. <clears throat> it's got to be completely rigid, and uh, this is rigid. Yeah. So, so it obviously it locks open really solid because you've got this nice little touch of having a, a mm -hmm. magnet there, so yeah. it's not yep, flopping stays around. put. And the stock is completely adjustable for every parameter. <clears throat> Height of comb, uh, length of pull, uh, plus cast off, cast on, you know, with the butt plate can mm -hmm. be moved around, up, yeah. down, over, sideways, you know, so. And there's just little touches, too, of like this this cheek pad where they refinished it matte, so it's not, uh, it's nice and smooth. It's just one of those things that's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I compatible, of course, it's got a mag, ambidextrous mag, mag release there. You can tailor the grip to your taste if you <clears throat> want more setback. Mm -hmm. Arca, <clears throat> we make an Arca type rail adapter for it. Okay. But you can have Picatinny on there also. Yeah, you've got, and this is the same attachment mechanism as <coughs> your standard <coughs> handguards as far as accessory rails? That's what we call our rapid configuration handguard and it takes all of our accessories. That's one thing <coughs> that uh, we haven't hit on that yet is you were super early, or it seems like anyways, for free float handguards. Obviously you mentioned Olympic and there's others out there, but you were pretty early on with this idea of having free yeah. float, but then modularity. We were the first. We were the first mechanism. that came up with the, you know, we didn't even call it that then. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we were the first of the so-called modular handguards. And what kind of brought that to me was interesting. Another shooting buddy of mine, Todd Salmon, uh, he was at the SOF one year, and, and I, saw, I saw him shooting his rifle can at 45 degrees. And he had our handguard on it, of course. Mm -hmm. And I said, Todd, what are you doing there? And he was, he was shooting his own hits on this 10-yard target you know, without using this optic. And I said, well, I can't use the optic. I says, so I just looked down at the slots in your handguard. And I, then it made, huh. me, made me realize that, well, if we put actually a cheap set of sights on the handguard there, that would even improve this. And of course, that led to the thing, well, now we got to put accessories everywhere on this yeah. thing. And we came up with a complete system to do that. And then this, that evolved into this one, which instead of using the backer plates, mm -hmm. which are a little bit time consuming to put, it, put in there, uh, this takes standard 1032 uh, hardware store, uh, hardware to, to mount your stuff so you know, know nothing uh, exotic that if you lose it, you're in trouble. You can actually replace this stuff in any hardware store to mount your rail pieces or any other accessories yeah. that you might want to put on there. Now everybody's got a modular free float there, rail. Right? <laughs> it's yeah. the standard. Uh, and then you've got some nice and early on it too. And then I don't know if the camera could see this very well, but uh, this is a pretty innovative thing. I don't know if I've seen anybody else ever do this, is uh, the heat sink yeah, on the, the barrel. <clears throat> and that's an application that's pretty useful just to ensure you're consistent shot yeah, to shot. You know, one day I was watching a uh, World War I movie, and I saw this biplane and flying towards the screen, and I noticed that it had a heat sink on the barrel and the Lewis gun on mm -hmm. the biplane. Right. Says we had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looked just like a. This is the modern. Well, outside of being on a bolt gun. So yeah, that looks like a Lewis gun right there. So it not only does it uh, dramatically increase the cooling capacity of the barrel, it also increases the rigidity of the barrel oh, too. Sure. So, and damps out the harmonics and minimi minimizes the harmonics yeah. of the barrel. So you sell barrel kits with the matched heat sink. Yep, you can get a barrel kit with the heat sink on there. This actually we just said to bring that actually into the bolt gun area here too. So we now our bolt gun barrels are actually set up to take our, our heat sinks. Awesome. Actually, we call it the thermal dissipator. Yeah, that's a much better <laughs> name. <laughs> uh, everyone, if you're just joining us, uh, we have John Paul from JP Enterprises. Uh, feel free to send us uh, your questions. We'll be happy to address them on the air, uh, covering quite a few of their products uh, right now. 
Uh, well, I think we could jump to the uh, the new stuff for this year, which is, uh, well, this is the chassis is new as well, but the uh, pistol caliber carbine. Uh, yeah, very here. exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, we got into the whole uh, pistol caliber carbine thing actually uh, some years back only because I just thought it was fun. Yeah. I thought they were fun to shoot, and so I said, well, let's let's buy some of these existing 9mm components out there and, and make a version of uh, a 9mm that we could we could sell with our handguard, for example, and mm -hmm. our trigger. Yeah. And after we kind of uh, got our feet wet in there, we, we started analyzing. We were the nitpickers that we are, of course, we were always tweaking things, and we realized that there was some uh, assumptions and some incorrect assumptions on the dimensions and the basic flaws in the bolts and the firing pins and whatnot that were causing reliability issues. And we sorted all that out. And of course, now we have all of our own components yeah. that are uh, custom made just, just to our specifications. We got a slugless bolt that's got the mass in it. Uh, and we make our, our bolts in a couple of different finishes. This is a, a rifle the shop just built for me, a all out game gun here. And this has all of the state of the art stuff that we have right now, which is the GMR-15 lower, the Glock mag yeah. receiver. And it, this is a lockback lower, and it is a short stroke system. So that, that's the latest thing. We've, we've come up with a short stroke system that shortens up the stroke to really the minimum necessary to allow the magazine to present reliably and to have it feed. And by shortening up that stroke about an inch there, we, we have further dramatically improved the speed and the controllability of the rifle. So if you're not living under a rock, you probably know we virtually dominate the PCC mm -hmm. thing at the serious levels of competition in the USPSA format. And the reason is our rifles work flawlessly, and of course they're the fastest oh, to, yeah. to shoot. So the other thing, of course, that we came out with this, with this rifle has in it, is our new ultralight 9mm barrel. Yeah, let's grab that. And on the, uh, the short strike, you can see that's how far that bolt's really traveling uh, compared to that full length that a normal 9mm right. travels. Pretty cool there. Let me get this guy out of the way. So one of the complaints, of course, or one of the uh, requests, I guess you could say, is people want the they want their rifles to be light, and we've always we actually carried that theme of lightweight without compromising accuracy or reliability <coughs> throughout all of our rifles. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to carry around excess mass for no reason, but in this case, especially if you get into the steel challenge type of competition, where it's important to be able to index the rifle quickly, drive it to the target, be able to stop it, you know, so you don't have all of the inertia carrying you beyond. You need that barrel to be as light as possible. So what we got here is a basically a five-inch barrel with a with a shroud. But what's unique about this is that we've incorporated a door here. You we've removed it here. Uh, this rifle has if you, if yeah, you, can, you can I don't know if you can see it, but it's this black fluted sleeve that fits over here. And what that allows you to do is to screw that forward after you remove the tube, and now you can clean the crown. Because once you recess the crown that far down this tube, we got nowhere to clean it. And I can tell you that. Uh, after thousands of rounds, you're going to have a lot of carbon build up there, and you need to be able to clean the crown off occasionally. And so we've got a, an easy sure. method to handle that problem. Yeah, and basically there's no mass basically from here forward. Right. So it, it almost feels a, like there's no barrel in the rifle. Yeah, you pick it up and you're like, well, what's <laughs> going on? You, you, it's kind of yep. a, an odd feeling at first. Very cool. All right, so we've got a question from Anthony. Uh, for the buff, buffer system and lightweight bulk carrier group, do you have to use an adjustable gas block? Well, let me uh, let me answer that by saying this: uh, we have two lightweight systems. We have the uh, the BC3, which is our stainless low mass, and I would say that if you use that particular carrier, you could get by without an adjustable gas system. But if you go with the BC1, which is the 7075 aluminum carrier, yeah. no, then to really make that work properly, you do need an adjustable gas system. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Great uh, question there, uh, Anthony. And uh, you have, I think, the only aluminum carrier on the market. I'm not aware of any others. Uh, what's that thing weigh in comparison to a standard carrier? It's a, it's like a fraction of it. I mean, yeah. it's you. I don't know exactly. Yeah. But Sorry. we have all those weights published. Oh yeah, you're very good about specs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you pick it up. Holy cow! And uh, it's funny because there there again we. Uh, we had a prototype aluminum carrier way back when we were experimenting. There again, it was kind of leading us down the path. First, first uh, efficient recoil elimination at the muzzle, mm -hmm. and then adjusting the gas, pre the port pressure to get the bolt velocity in the sweet spot. And then what I realized is the next thing we had to do was play around with the mass of the operating yeah. system. 
and we had an aluminum carrier that we experimented with and once we adjusted that thing so it operated properly that was like the next order of magnitude kind of improvement in the feel of the rifle so and I would never put an aluminum carrier in a duty rifle or yeah. a home defense rifle but ultimate race gun balls to the wall yeah. you know uh, ultimate performance in terms of impulse yeah that in the 556 for sure that that's Best it to have yeah that's cool now you've you've obviously done some other bolt improvements or a bolt carrier group improvements right here. Well, what am I looking at here? Yeah, well that, that's our high pressure bolt for the uh, 308 class rifles. Mm -hmm. Very, the, of course, where this really comes into play is in these six fives and six millimeter rifles because your standard uh, 308 type bolts have a very large firing pin orifice, yeah. <clears throat> and that leads to a lot of uh, primer. Uh, extrusion into the into the bolt face and you know, and a number of other other issues that we we have solved. So this this bolt can tolerate the the use with those cartridges that have a, a bit of a higher pressure curve, higher chamber pressure, and eliminates the primer flow. And also you notice the pri the firing pin is is quite different, and yeah. it's got an 062 tip on it. And this thing is crazy light. Like if you yeah. pick up a firing pin, you don't think it's going to be much anyways, but this is... And of course, every one of these bolts comes with this firing pin. It's a titanium firing pin with an 062 tip, so <clears throat> fits this bolt. And you notice that it's not only skeletonized, but it weighs practically nothing. Uh, that does improve your lock time, but really the thing is that once we've uh, eliminated or uh, reduced the, the tip diameter, yeah. that increases the kinetic energy transferred in a smaller space. Oh, sure. And so to eliminate any possibility of a slam fire, that's another reason why we've automatically supplied this with all the high pressure bolts and with all, it also comes with all the BC-1 7075 uh, ultra low oh, mass carriers. Oh, interesting, okay. Right. Very nice. Another cool thing, you know, there again, we're kind of into the details of this. <laughs> we're always, yeah. we're nitpicking down to the lower, the lowest possible level. And we have our own gas rings. A lot of people don't realize that we have a centerless ground gas ring, which is mm -hmm. precisely ground to fit the diameter of the bore diameters mm -hmm. of our carriers, limiting almost all the friction. So typically our stuff doesn't pass that test where you stack it upside down. It yeah. will collapse, and that's not a problem because that's the way we've designed yeah. it. And so this actually seals better than any of the uh, three-piece rings but yet eliminates the friction. And the more friction that you can eliminate in the operating system, guess yeah. what? The wider the operational window of the whole rifle becomes under adverse conditions. Yeah, but you're still getting that seal. even though Seal's great, right. That's by holding tight tolerances yes. through your QC processes. Yeah. Right, yeah, the tolerances we hold on our parts are second to none, and that, that's a good reason. There's several barrel manufacturers now that actually use our bolts mm -hmm. with their barrels for that very reason, because they know that our bolts are consistent from lot to lot, you know, they're within a half, and that's fantastic. That kind of tolerancing. Got another question here uh, from Michael. Uh, Michael asks, you presented the 9mm. Is there any 45 ACP in the future of JP Enterprises introducing, uh, or on the AR format anyways? <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. Probably not in the near future. If, if anything, we may, we may explore the 40. I'm not sure we'd, we'd go on the uh, 45 ACP route, but, yeah. but uh, that, that's probably uh, not this year for sure. Okay. We, we've kind of got our hands full of, of other things which have taken you know, the front burner where markets we feel are really more pressing at, at the moment, like the PCC market as it, as it exists now and, of course, the, the manual rifle precision market. Okay. All right. Good question, Michael, regardless. Um, as far as the PCC, you mentioned you're basically the leader there. Um, I, basically, anybody winning competitions is using that type of setup? That, that Pretty much. Yeah. It's a... It's predominant out there. Uh, I think that the, this, the stats at the last uh, PCC Nationals, I think we had about 33% of it, which wow. was, you know, like over 10 points higher than I think the next the next uh, manufacturer. And then equally in the in the home built rifles, we dominated the home built rifles too in terms yeah. of our componentry. Okay, so uh, there's obviously a lot of AR manufacturers out there today. Uh, what are those key things that set you apart? Is it just the QC? Is it just the design <laughs> philosophy? What are the, what's that batch of things that really sets you above the rest? Well, I always uh, like to think it's, uh, it's a certain philosophy and, uh, and irresponsibility on my part. Because <laughs> when I got into this, really, it was to solve my own problems, you know, and luckily we had a lot of people had, their, had those similar problems with their rifles. But really, uh, we, it's always been our philosophy that uh, we're, we're not, if you, you look at any other company, they're, they're in it to make a profit. And especially mm -hmm. a publicly held company, they're, uh, oh. they have to 
be responsible to the stockholders. It's all about the bottom line. And quite honestly, I'm constantly making the decisions that are maybe not advantageous to the bottom line, yeah. but by God, they make for the best possible products. Yeah. And you know what? We've been phenomenally successful. And uh, so it's like, yeah, that uh, it's... I, I, sometimes I can't believe how far the product has penetrated, not only in this country, but overseas. We've got a huge, oh, yeah. a Absolutely. huge export market. And that's kind of interesting, too, because if you can afford to shoot, to shoot in Europe, well, you're not going to buy any second yeah. rate. I mean, and, you're, you're going to go right to the top. In some countries, I believe they can only have one of a particular right. type of rifle. So if you're going to buy one of something, that's all you can have. Yeah. You're going to get something pretty nice. Yeah, and, and uh, it's interesting, I think, that also to know that once you've tried our, our equipment, you realize that, you, yeah, okay, it's not cheap, mm -hmm. but you realize really it's the value play yeah. <laughs> because we're giving you really so much value for the money. That's, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. So you've obviously got a lot of winning products here. What are maybe some of those products you came up with that you thought were going to do great and then they just never took off for whatever reason? You got any <laughs> well, of those? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, you see, I try to block those from my memory. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've had a number of them. Yeah. Uh, I can remember one, uh, this, this one I remember because we still got these sitting on the shelf. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we remember at the, the, the 84, the, I think it was the, 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 uh, the, the assault rifle ban of, what was it, 84? Nine, I forget. 94 to 94, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we got around uh, some of that by this a subtle interpretation by ATF about you, you, know, you know, muzzles being threaded for a flash of pressure. Okay. So we had non-standard thread patterns. But in addition, I know there's all kinds of half-28 rifles out there. And, and so I came up with this, uh, this uh, harmonic tuner thing, which kind of looked like a flash of pressure. Mm -hmm. you, you'd had to th put a thread adapter from half 28 to three quarter 28, and this thing threaded on over that and moved up and down the barrel. And I thought, well, it looked like a flash suppressor, also worked as a harmonic tuner. I can tell you that was a flop. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I, I think we got boxes of those, okay. those parts left. Not sure what we're going to do with those. Okay. But, uh, and then we did a, one, at one point in time, we were actually doing a, uh, like a high power across the course type rifle, you know, a mm -hmm. space gun. Oh, sure. And uh, I, I don't shoot that game. And, you know, I've always found if, you, if you're not shooting particular discipline, well, you're probably uh, not, too, not too likely to penetrate it. And we had, uh, we had eight inch bloop tubes, you know, that fit on the end of our, our barrels for that. And uh, we had quite a few of those left over, too. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure you learned some good <laughs> lessons from those. Uh, but so, so, and you mentioned that uh, that you got to shoot uh, in those given markets yep. and, and get a real feel for it. So right now you're uh, you, you're always still out shooting, but you're doing PRS. You're doing three gun still. What are you doing right now? Well, I, I certainly have shot a lot of three gun over the years, and uh, uh, of course, when I shot the the first ITRC, I really became obsessed with that precision shooting market mm -hmm. and that really changed the direction of our product line kind of like a wholesale change of my my focus and we started looking at the gas guns more in the precision nature and especially the large format rifles and <coughs> uh, further improving the accuracy and the addition of cartridges that were applicable to those disciplines the bolt gun products and uh, you know further going you know going down that road uh, uh, I guess I became uh, obsessed with the, with ballistics and, and optics. Uh, some of my friends will say that I'm an optics whore, and that's uh, true. I, <laughs> I, uh, anytime something new comes out in the scope, I'm buying it, and, yeah. and I, uh, I'm a reticle shooter. Okay. And so then, you know, the combination, I really felt the combination with the gas-operated rifle and a reticle-based system, like a horse vision mm -hmm. horse reticle-based system on that, so you never had to get out the gun, and you knew what your, what your holes are to the tenth. Uh, it's yeah. a mil rad system. You know, that really made the most effective long-range precision shooting system out there mm -hmm. and the fastest, you know, never, not even to got off it to actuate it or to dial. That, uh, that was kind of a, a direction we went. So then we started looking at scope mounts and uh, improving, say, what I, what I felt that the scope mounts needed to be in terms of not only the rigidity but non-quick detachable. Uh, they're, you know, tool detachable, of course. And now we have 20 MOA mounts, so we've further expanded that. Yeah, yeah, we forgot to mention that right there, JP optic mount. Yeah. So where do you see uh, just your uh, your five-year vision? Where do you see PRS going? Where do you see the AR stuff going in the next few years? What do you what? What's the feel for things? 
Well, you know, actually, one of our focuses now is that it's interesting as we've dominated these competition shooting markets over the years, law enforcement and military has really taken notice of that. And so we're looking mm -hmm. at, they're going to get further, further into that market. And we've yeah. got, we've made tremendous inroads into the LE market now that they realize that we bring this, both this reliability and this accuracy, uh, you know, to, to bear there. And of course, you know, our customer service is uh, second to none. Oh, so yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier that uh, really competition used to be kind of frowned upon. Now competition is viewed they as... They get it. That's, <laughs> that's where stuff is being tried out and proofed yeah. before it goes to these other uh, arenas where you yeah. need 100% reliability. No, I've always looked at it as really the anvil upon which all of this had been forged, in particular mm -hmm. the, the old uh, Soldier Fortune World Championship, which I shot for many years. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I got into that particular brand of three-gun, I realized that they had it right from the philosophical standpoint yeah. of what it was and how to run it and that really became the kind of the outlook that i had and what the equipment had to do to be able to use it in the hands of a professional and yeah. not be the limiting factor yeah good stuff well thank you john i appreciate you coming in here and doing this it's been great it's a great. lot of is there anything else you'd like to hit on or well, unless you got more questions. I, I, I think we're good there. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and customers, if you do have, or anybody watching this, if you have questions, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Um, if we didn't get to them on air, we'll uh, answer them uh, here afterwards. Um, yeah, fantastic I want to take, just take the opportunity to, to thank all of our customers out there because your support over these years, the tremendous support has made this all possible. And it's been the, one of the biggest satisfactions of my life to be able to do this. That's fantastic. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone.